Thank you. Um, thanks, Nicole, uh, for doing the recording. Um, and good afternoon to all our guests today. Thank you for joining us um, to learn about Pennsylvania's history with our very first installment of our new series um, on PA history and um, that we coordinated with the library and the Pennsylvania Historic and Museum Commission. My name is Ellen Schenk, and I'm the PA engagement librarian for the State Library. The PA History Read It and See It is a new series of virtual programs. Each month will feature a fun and factual investigation into one of the Trail of History sites. These programs will provide suggestions for books relating to each topic that you may find at your local public library, examples of site-specific rare and historic books from the vaults of the State Library's unique Rare Collections Library, and a special insider virtual tour of Pennsylvania's historic sites and museums. Let us inspire you as you plan your seasonal road trips across the state. The first stop on our journey through Pennsylvania history is the Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum. We'd like to welcome David Blackburn, director of the Landis Valley site. He'll tell us more about the museum's Pennsylvania German heritage and what life was like in their early Pennsylvania village. Afterwards, Rare Collections Librarian Michael Lear will show you some treasured materials in the vaults of the State Library, and Kathy Hale will give you reading suggestions for learning more about the sites and books you can find or request from your local library. We'll also um, share a link in the chat with further reading suggestions for you. So thank you again for joining us, and now I'll turn it over to David Blackburn. David, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Ellen, it's a pleasure to uh, be here and uh, certainly appreciate you kicking off the series with our very own Landis Valley um, and really focusing on the extraordinary uh, resources of the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. So uh, again, my name is uh, David. Um, I've been in this uh, position for less than a year. I have the unique distinction of starting here at Landis Valley in the midst of our global pandemic. So it's been a most interesting time uh, to uh, land into the seat. Um, my uh, tenure with PHMC is new. I come to Commonwealth employment after 34 years with uh, the National Park Service. Most recently, uh, right here in our backyard at Hopewell Furnace National Historic uh, historic site. So again, I'm thrilled uh, to be here and thrilled to be representing Landis and uh, PHMC. So let me share my screen and we'll get started. Okay, I'm hoping everyone can see the slide deck. Uh, yes, we can. Great, and here we go. So the, the mission of uh, Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum is to quote, um, provide a glimpse into lives, ingenuity and material culture of rural Pennsylvania Germans from 1740 to 1940. So today my program will be a very broad introduction to three facets of what we do. The first is a broad overview of Germanic peoples in uh, Pennsylvania. The second is the connections of multi-generations of the Landis family to um, our area of Lancaster County. And then uh, the final portion is the establishment of uh, the what is now known as the Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum. Um, let's see. Oops. There we are. So let me first uh, introduce you to what is it that uh, we mean in terms of regions where Pennsylvania Germans came from. Uh, the German speaking immigrants who came to the great colony of, of Pennsylvania starting in about 1683 um, came principally from uh, several broad areas of uh, Central Europe. What links all of these uh, folks together is not the country, because remember in the 17th century, Germany does not exist, but instead it's their language. The greatest majority of immigrants came from this area of Germany, or of modern Germany called uh, the Palatinate. 
Uh, its southern border is France, and its eastern border is the Rhine River. They are coming to uh, Pennsylvania, though, uh, from other areas of German-speaking areas of Europe. And let me pull up uh, a map here so it's easier to show you rather than describe. So one area is adjacent uh, or it's close to the Palatinate, and we know it um, as uh, Alsace. Lorraine. You can see the town of Strasbourg, the town of Colmar in modern day France, the city of Stuttgart in Germany. And so this is the general area that I'm circling of the Alsace. Also, German speaking immigrants came from this area of Switzerland, anchored by modern Liechtenstein in Zurich. Switzerland is divided into counties known as cantons, and the German-speaking cantons is this area adjacent to uh, modern-day modern day Germany. There is a final German-speaking area that we find immigrants from uh, coming in the 17th and 18th century, and that's what historically was known as Bohemia, today part of the Czech Republic centering on Prague. Again, to give you orientation, modern day Poland is here with Warsaw, Dresden, and uh, southeastern Germany up here, and then modern day Germany here. So from the 1680s to the first third of the 18th century, this is the region, these are the regions upon which folks um, emigrated to what was the colony of Pennsylvania. Let me also speak uh, briefly on terminology. Many of you, I'm sure, uh, are familiar with and use the term Pennsylvania Dutch when describing uh, the contemporary region or describing history. Pennsylvania Dutch is a, is a term that we use, but I want to make a differentiation. For folks who are not familiar with our history or come from um, outside of the area, Dutch automatically brings pictures of the Netherlands or Holland to mind. Actually, Dutch is an anglicized or middle English word for Deutsch or German. So I'll be using Pennsylvania Dutch and Pennsylvania German interchangeably, but um, this is to emphasize that Dutch is German not uh, anything from the low countries. So why is it that we have this push of German speakers to um, North America and specifically to this area that we now know as Pennsylvania? In a word, it's uh, the Reformation. In two words, the Protestant Reformation. During uh, uh, this time period in the 16th and 17th century, as Protestantism comes to a fore, it's a time of great change throughout Europe. It's a time of violent change as well with the, the 30 years war, um, sectarian violence between uh, Roman Catholics and the emerging Protestant sects. During this time, conservative, conservative uh, Protestants, uh, a group that we'll be focusing on here, the Anabaptists, are being persecuted for their beliefs. So throughout the 17th century, we have years of war leaving economic, cultural, and agricultural destruction um, in their wake. William Penn in 1681, um, with uh, the, the Charter of Pennsylvania uh, being established, invites uh, different groups to come to what he calls the holy experiment of, uh, of Pennsylvania, in that he sees the foundation of what he's building here. Two things, one is uh, religious toleration, and the religious tolerance and the other is um, land coming here to freely celebrate your religion in the same time as settling in with uh, cheap uh, cheap land the combination of this 
provided uh, the economic opportunities, as well as freedom to practice the religion. And for later in the German uh, uh, immigration, you could say even freedom from religion. All of this were um, elements that brought these German-speaking Protestants to uh, Pennsylvania. What is not often understood is that because of this movement throughout the 18th century, um, the areas that we now know as Lancaster and Berks County, by the mid to um, 18th century, uh, the start of the revolution, nearly 70% of the population of these counties, uh, the, their first language was um, German. But as you can see from this map, um, highlighting the spread of German um, immigrants and speakers by the 1760s, you find a band through York, through Northampton, through Bucks, and through Philadelphia. Um, as we go later in the 18th century, you also find German speakers uh, spreading out into other uh, counties throughout Pennsylvania, particularly Carbon, Monroe, Lehigh, Northampton, and Wayne counties. But um, the prominent German-speaking uh, population was really centered in the area that you see here. And that goes not just for Pennsylvania, but for all of colonial uh, North America. This was the center point of, of, um, German, of, of German speakers and German-speaking Protestants. Coming from Europe, in addition to this enticement for freedom um, of, of expression of their beliefs, as well as the avail availability to settle in land, these German Protestant enclaves are often coming as families and as communities and as congregations, as opposed to English or other immigrants that tend to come as family or extended families these German speakers are often coming as intact groups, which means that when they come to an English colony, they are settling as intact um, groups, which is why you see this somewhat cultural and linguistic uh, separation or segregation is the fact that culturally and linguistically, as well as religiously, these folks are immigrating in groups, a very different pattern than you see from others. So then in terms, as we go through the 18th into the 19th century, this leads to very different patterns of, of assimilation into larger society. You see great differences between um, urban and rural German um, speakers, as well as those that are more uh, conservatively religious and those that may uh, go into broad reform or mainstream uh, religious groups. So speaking of enclaves, let's turn to one group that in contemporary Pennsylvania is the group we often associated as Pennsylvania Dutch. And those are the groups that we associate today with um, the uh, term Amish and to a lesser extent uh, Mennonite. I want to emphasize that here at Landis Valley, when we're talking about Pennsylvania German history um, from 1740 to 1940, Pennsylvania Dutch and Pennsylvania German is all encompassing to all Pennsylvania German cultural and religious groups that, um, that um, arrived here, lived here, and flourished here. It's just today with modern tourism, modern marketing, and other things, that Pennsylvania Dutch in the 21st century often, to be, often tends to be looked at in a very, um, a very narrow way. Speaking also of um, religion, Mennonite and Anabaptists have carried their beliefs through time to the 21st century with uh, changes um, over, over time. Um, keep in mind though that the heaviest immigration of Anabaptists is coming up to about 1720. 
from the 1720s up to the um, revolution and beyond, you then find um, other Protestant German groups coming to Pennsylvania, uh, less for religious freedom and more for economic opportunities. And very quickly, it's these other Protestant groups, um, including the German Reformed, now known as the United Church of Christ, and other Lutheran groups that uh, quickly outnumber the Anabaptists and become the majority of German speakers. Here in Lancaster, what we now know as Lancaster County, uh, the first German speakers who actually came to this area was about 1710, 1711, and they identified as Mennonites. It was these Mennonites that were the first uh, Germans in Caucasians um, in Lancaster County of any great number. And as a result of them, and then later the Amish, the county is established in 1729, and the city uh, is established in, uh, in 17, of Lancaster is established in 1730. One of the things that brings Pennsylvania Germans to this area and where they quickly establish themselves is that of agriculturalists. Now, the first agriculturalists and farmers in this region for hundreds, if not thousands of years, are the Native Americans. And it's the Native Americans that establish uh, uh, crops such as corn, squash, and pumpkins in the extraordinarily rich soils of this region. When you see um, uh, Europeans coming to the Atlantic coast and settling in areas formerly settled by uh, Native American populations, it's corn, squash, and pumpkins that become incorporated into the uh, uh, range of plants that are cultivated by Pennsylvania Germans um, and others. The Pennsylvania Germans that come here are, excuse me, subsistence farmers, but also keep in mind as Europeans in a colonial uh, economy, they are part of a regional and a global economy too. So with the success of subsistence farming here, very quickly Pennsylvania Germans establish themselves into the larger agricultural um, economy of colonial Pennsylvania. By the 1760s, Pennsylvania is one of the largest food producers um, in the colonies, as well as one of the largest producers of wheat. Uh, by the time of the revolution and beyond, uh, this area of Pennsylvania is also a very large uh, producer of tobacco commensurate to what you see coming in uh, Virginia and Maryland. So as agriculture is a thread that brings Pennsylvania Germans here, it's a thread that continues throughout uh, the 18th, 19th century, and um, even today is prominent within Pennsylvania Germans in the region. And one of my colleagues um, stated that Lancaster County is one of the top non-irrigated agricultural regions in the entire United States. So let's shift gears from the broad German Pennsylvania uh, population to um, our own particular area. Um, and we'll focus on uh, the Landis family. The Landis occupation actually begins with John Jacob Snavely when he arrives into America in 1718. His family eventually emigrates to um, Lancaster County and he buys 200 acres in this area that uh, the museum is now, um, now in. Where the Landis Valley connection begins is um, after uh, 1728, when the Snavely family builds a stone house and uh, creates a permanent settlement here. Snavesley's um, daughter marries um, uh, and uh, and go. Excuse me. Uh, Snavesley's daughter marries um, into the Benjamin Landis uh, family. Uh, Benjamin Landis marries Anne's daughter, and that's where the Landis occupation uh, begins here. The Snavesley household is not on the museum grounds, but is. Uh, close to us um, today. And with this Snavely-Landis connection, this begins the Landis Association 
in the area that lasts uh, for many uh, generations. One of the things that made Landis uh, successful, as well as the surrounding agricultural uh, Pennsylvania Germans that settled in here, is the network of roads and internal um, transportation. As opposed to other parts of the colonies where the riverine transports, rivers, bays, estuaries are the principal transports, because of the rich agricultural regions, because of the iron uh, region that develops to the east of us, we have a very well established network of uh, internal transit. And if you look here from 1858 on the map of Mannheim Township, you can see uh, the effort of Turnpike, major north-south road, but you also take note of the notices here that settle in what becomes the Landis Valley property. You've got the main north-south or Great Road going north to Reading and then south uh, to Lancaster. And then also in the same area, you have this major east-west uh, transit. They all uh, meet in what becomes the Landis Valley homesteads. And I'll show you um, through a satellite photo. Um, although the modern uh, transit networks have changed dramatically, this is the Landis Valley network today. This is the core of the historic buildings. And although the modern highways now bypass us, this junction of the north, south, and east, west is still the geographic center of our museum today. And it's at, it's at this junction that we find the Landis family and then ultimately the Landis brothers uh, settling and uh, calling home. Here in the picture late in life are George and Henry Landis, the founders of the Landis Valley Museum and the last of the Landis Valley generations that live here and live in the home that you see that we still preserve um, today. It's uh, Henry Kinzer, uh, this uh, fellow on my right, um, and his brother George Diller. Henry uh, is born in 1865 and lives to 1955. His brother George is born in 1867 and lives till 1854. They are the gentlemen who uh, carry on the Landis tradition of um, farming on their home site, but they are the Landises that found and established the Landis Valley Museum um, in uh, 1925. Well, who are these gentlemen? Uh, this is a dapper uh, photograph taken in uh, the town of Lidditz when they were youths. Both of them were educated in uh, nearby Lidditz, the Lidditz Academy, and both of them studied engineering in what became today's uh, Lehigh University. Um, Henry Kay actually uh, moved to New York and established a um, career as an engineer and for most of his uh, life, his professional life as an editor of engineering technical journals. He lives in Manhattan and the last 10 years of his time in uh, Manhattan, he moves to Port Washington on the North Shore of Long Island. George um, actually ends up being the manager of Lancaster City's Department of Sanitation. He stays here and he continues to manage um, the farm. Although they both come from the same family, they are very different men. Uh, George was very reserved, very introverted, very quiet. Um, and the only great writing that he did was some collaborative articles on collections and collecting that he did with his uh, brother. Henry was the man of letters. He has voluminous, um, we have voluminous um, letters in our collection. He, we have journals, we have articles, and he even wrote his autobiography. Although they both are credited with founding the museum, Henry is really uh, the mover and shaker, and I would say the brain trust behind what becomes uh, the Landis Valley Museum. As youths, they collect. 
Uh, but as they get older, they really begin focusing on collections and collecting. And by the 1880s, I think they would both state they were collectors. By the 19 teens, they are hitting the auction circuit. They're known as nickel men, and that as opposed to the great American collectors of Henry Ford or Henry DuPont, these folks have farm income and professional income and are buying as nickel men five cent baskets at the end of auctions filled with stuff. And it's often this stuff as well as commonplace objects, furniture that becomes and books that becomes the core of their um, their collection. And it's through this that they're collecting the everyday objects of their um, ancestors, uh, the Pennsylvania Germans. The Landeses um, all throughout uh, generations were Mennonites. George and Henry, I think if they were pressed, would identify themselves as Mennonites, but they weren't active with um, a congregation. The driving force behind this collecting was to preserve their past, the, the past of their ancestors in the past of Pennsylvania Germans. As they're seeing industrialization of the nation, they're seeing uh, their culture and their state and their county changing dramatically. They want to preserve the material culture of their past, of their people for, um, the fu for um, future Pennsylvanians. Um, George actually, or excuse me, Henry is actually quoted as saying, quote, these Dutch people have distinct characteristics and have achieved nationwide distinction for their dis sterling qualities. It is important that attention should be called to their culture and standards uh, through those tools of their craft and arts and customs that are um, obtainable. So Henry and George wants to make their past, which they so identify with, visible and accessible through a huge array of their artifacts. They open the family or the museum as the Barn Museum in 1925. And here you get a, a picture that it's not just furniture and high end objects, it's everyday objects in huge quantities. Very quickly, um, they expand uh, the museum um, a few years later in 1939 and expanded to the Yellow Barn. Interestingly, by the 1930s, they attract the interest of the Carl Schurz Foundation, funded through a great German uh, uh, industri American industrialist, Gustav Oberlander. And it's through the Schurz Foundation that uh, the Landis brothers received money to build uh, the barn, and more importantly, in 1941, to build this building, which is the center, one of the center points of the museum today, the old tavern and gun shop uh, behind it. So by 1941, the Landis Valley Museum includes outbuildings, the barn, and this tavern with their huge collection of, um, of material. Yet, um, as time goes on um, and as the museum grows, the foundation uh, becomes less, well, less wealthy and the brothers want to see this museum preserved into the future. Um, they have an interest as early as the 1940s to turn this over to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, so through long-term negotiations in 19. Uh, 53, the Landis Museum becomes the Pennsylvania State Farm Museum and becomes a unit of the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission with the core buildings that you see here, the tavern and uh, the yellow barn. The house that I showed earlier becomes the home of uh, George and Henry. They have life ownership into their deaths in 1954 and 1955. Through time, uh, PHMC begins to expand the building, uh, the museum. They purchase 
this, the Landis House Museum, just across the green from the core of the Landis Brothers Museum. They purchase other buildings. They begin to bring other buildings on site to build the village campus that you see today. Through that expansion um, in the 60s and 70s, we go from the Pennsylvania Farm Museum to what you see today, the Landis Valley uh, Village and Farm Museum, encompassing the breadth and depth of George and Henry's collection and encompassing the breadth of Pennsylvania German um, history. We do that today through collections, through exhibits, through living history demonstrations um, that highlight 18th and 19th century crafts and lifeways that are not only part of America of the 18th and 19th century, but help to exhibit the lifeways that were shaped by Pennsylvania Germans or uh, were used by Pennsylvania Germans to perpetuate their own material um, culture. So um, today on this hot day, as we look at the core of the village uh, from the great snow of this uh, last winter, we see um, a village that never existed, but a village that uh, carries on the core mission of the Landis Brothers, of a place that through buildings, programs, and materials preserves the breadth and depth of not only the Landis family, but um, the Pennsylvania German experience, an experience that shaped our colony, shaped our commonwealth, and shaped the, the place that we call home um, today. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleagues from the, uh, the State Library. Thank you so much, David. Um, it was so great to see that, you know, history of the site and how it sort of formed in time. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy and Michael, who are going to give um, everyone in our um, program today some suggestions on materials and a little um, ideas about what we have at the State Library, too. Okay, I'll go first. My name is Kathy Hale. I am the supervisor for public services at the State Library of Pennsylvania. As you can see in the chat, Ellen and Nicole have put up some links to different materials that are going to be available. I'm going to take a minute and share my screen And this is a piece that Michael and I put together about the Read It, See It program that is going to be going on throughout 2021, 2022 of different places that we're going to go throughout Pennsylvania. So the first one that you see is about the Landis Valley Farm and Museum. You can see on the left hand side, we have put together some things about the Pennsylvania German or the Pennsylvania Dutch lifestyle that are at the State Library and at other libraries throughout Pennsylvania. In the middle, under the section that says about registering for the event that you're on today, you will see a couple of tabs. One is for books. These are books that are in the State Library about Pen the Pennsylvania German experience. We have some Pennsylvania German dictionaries. We have different things about quilts. Quilts is a very big part of the Pennsylvania Dutch experience. Uh, we also have a lot of cookbooks so that if you want to do some Pennsylvania Dutch cooking, such as shoe fly pie or whoopie pies, you can do that as well. We also have a few articles, some periodicals, which are different magazines that are available to you. Anytime you see a blue link, that means that you can link out to the various issues of that particular magazine. We also put together some free digital places that you can go for 
things on the Pennsylvania German culture. So the first one is the Center for Pennsylvania German Culture at Millersville. There's also the Digital Public Library, Kutztown Folk Festival, Pennsylvania Cultural Heritage Center at Kutztown. And there's also the Power Library. For those of you who may not know the Power Library, this is an electronic resource that's available to any Pennsylvanian who has a library card in Pennsylvania at a library in Pennsylvania so that you can go there and look at different images that has to do with Pennsylvania German life. If you want to read specific books, you can also, uh, about the Landis Valley Museum, you can also click on the links for these other books that will tell you about different things and there are some good pictures. For those of you who may be teachers or those with young children, we also put some information about some coloring pages and books for children. Michael also put together that if you want to search more on the Pennsylvania German life, you can look in the Power Library catalog. That will take you out to a place that you can look for things that are at libraries throughout Pennsylvania, or you can also go to the State Libraries catalog, use these different subject areas, and look for more information on the Pennsylvania German folk life. So that there's lots of things for you to see. You will see over on the left-hand side that there are, we're gonna go over to the Drake Well Museum, the Cornwell Iron Furnace, Pensbury Manor, different places. So come back to this website often in order to look for other materials that are about different things that have to do with the museum sites that we're going to be doing throughout this series of read it and see it. Okay, Michael, I'm gonna start, stop sharing my screen and let you take over for a little bit. Okay, thanks. Or I'll try to keep this, what, five minutes? Uh, so, so share my screen. So can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. I didn't know if I hit that button. So I put together some highlights, you know, uh, this, uh, because we're short on time and, and I can't show everything. This is just a sampling of Pennsylvania, uh, materials in the, from the rare collections that relate to Pennsylvania German agriculture or, or, or printed in Pennsylvania. So they have a Pennsylvania connection. We of course have many other books uh, on European and American agriculture through the 17th and 18th centuries, along with a large Pennsylvania government documents collection that has published materials, materials published by the Department of Agriculture of the state. So uh, you're one of the most useful so here are the types of materials we have. We have farmer's almanacs, uh, other periodicals, since almanacs were annual publications, we have other periodicals, scientific papers, agricultural society publications, catalogs and practical guides, such as veterinary care, home remedies, livestock and crop husbandry works. So the most uh, appealing maybe to the busy farmer were the, the uh, German language almanacs in the 18th and 19th centuries. Those were digest of uh, different, uh, different literature or different fast facts or uh, wit and wisdom, weather forecasts, astrological, astronomical observations, facts, uh, practical farm and household hints. And through time, these reflect both tradition from the old world and acculturation into American, uh, becoming more fully American. So this was an example earlier of the earliest German almanac. It was first published in 1739. There's 
bunch of other titles. There's too numerous to mention all kinds of German language almanacs in the 19th century. And these were published mostly up until about 1918. A lot, a lot disappeared earlier, but 1918 with, you know, World War One sentiment being anti-German, you start to see German language publishing kind of decline. And also that reflects, you know, more acculturation several generations in that maybe no longer speak German as their first language. And, th and this almanac is John Baer's almanac, the German version it was also published in English and still published today. I think it's their 196th year this year. Here's an example of a periodical the Lancaster farmer. And a nice illustration from that. And an article on plums. This, this uh, other publication was published locally in Mechanicsburg. Uh, this, I, you know, I can't say that this appealed to Germans in particular, but this was a Pennsylvania imprint. It was interesting, caught my eye because it was about sorghum used to produce sugar. Then there's different agricultural societies active in the 19th century, the York, the Agricultural Society of York, and there was the Lancaster County Agricultural Society. There was an earlier Philadelphia Society for Promoting Agriculture. There's the Pennsylvania State Agricultural Society, and they ran a precursor of the farm show. Uh, they began in 1851 as a society, and they also were advocates for the creation of the agricultural college that became Penn State. List of premiums, prizes. There's also catalogs. We don't have colorful catalogs such as burpee catalogs, but these caught my eye as being produced in Pennsylvania, this nursery catalog. And uh, uh, farm implement and tools catalog for agricultural and horticultural use. This one I just put in there because it was colorful, reminiscent of seed catalogs you see in the 19th century that would be used by all sorts of peoples, you know, whether they're Germans or not in, you know, in Pennsylvania for their uh, farming and gardening. And then here's practical guides. These appealed to Germans, you know, published in the German language. This one's this one's on horses and sheep and cattle and uh, pigs and uh, geese and chickens. So this was published 1771. And then here's, here, this represents th that earlier one from 1771 was likely based on uh, an old world German publication. But here you see an American publication. This is the American uh, horse art or horse uh, doctor published in Philadelphia. And then this actually, this goes back, this is an American uh, Pennsylvania publication of a 17th century German book on horses and, and veterinary medicine. There's an illustration from that of the horse and whatever that chapter is about. And then this is actually uh, about surveying, practical surveying for the farmer, you know, to mark their land or uh, something like that that was published in Reading. And then this is a book on home remedies. You see a lot of publications for the, you know, the, the rural uh, population, a lot of publications for home remedies taking care of your medical needs at home. And this was published by Johann Hohmann, who was a German immigrant. And he's known, um, he's more known for his book, The Long Lost Friend, about uh, folk medicine. But this is a, diff a different publication that I highlighted here. And then here's a, an English language uh, publication published in Lancaster <clears throat> that 
you know, as, as a, a more of a comprehensive handbook. Some of these other ones were more related solely to horses. This this is a little more comprehensive, and and I think it also contains, you know, uh, home remedies and maybe other kind of uh, home economic type things. And so that's all I have. So I guess uh, Ellen's going to answer, open it up to questions. Um, please, if anyone has questions, um, feel free to add them in the chat. There are a few here that we can start with. I'm going to ask you a question, Michael, since we since we were just talking about the rare books. Are any of the ones that you um, show there digitized, or would we visit the library to look at the rare books? Can you hear me, Michael? <laughs> Michael, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. Uh, okay. There you go. Now, now you I'm on. Uh, yeah, that's something I had uh, had neglected to look at, but it's uh, it's 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 definitely a possibility that some of these are available digitally, and that that reminds me that that's something I could add to our our guide you know, uh, maybe add links to a digitized version of these. Perfect. Great. If, if anybody um, needs, uh, the, I posted the link in the chat um, that has the recommendations in it. Um, but if you get out of this and need it again, just please email us and we'll send you a copy of this um, uh, document to be created with all our recommendations on it. Okay, so the next question. Okay, David, how did you decide to include the various buildings on site? And what is your favorite spot at the museum? Well, if you were to come here today, what you see is uh, uh, a conglomeration of 30 years worth of, of, of work. Um, I can't say for certain if what you see is frozen in time. The last buildings that were built here were the 1980s. Um, throughout the 70s, uh, <clears throat> the early 70s through the early 80s, there were several historic buildings a threat for being lost in Lancaster City that were appropriate uh, to the time frame and the history that were moved here. In 71, there were two buildings that were constructed uh, to serve as our gift shop and our country store to add to kind of the, the, the village-like um, atmosphere. And then to address 18th century German farmsteads, we have kind of a log cabin um, uh, uh, homestead that was um, built, from, built, built from scratch. So the combined total is showing different phases of growth and different phases of development to, and it also is what helped lend us from being just the Pennsylvania Farm Museum to the Landis Valley Village, um, Village Museum. So with these combination of existing buildings from the Landis era, uh, construction from the 70s and 80s, as well as buildings, the grand total helps to um, emulate and, and allow us to interpret different facets across different time periods of Pennsylvania German German history. Um, in terms of a favorite uh, favorite uh, spot, uh, that's kind of putting me on the spot. I, I, I can say, as with any good museum professional, I have no favorite spots. It's all it's all beautiful. I, I I guess I would say when you're in the central portion of the green, and I can turn around and take a 360 view at the junction of the original 18th century roads and see the village that we've created, we preserve, and we share. I, if I have to say as a favorite, that would be it. Kathy wondered if anybody could can volunteer to work with you. Uh, yeah, uh, we have an active volunteer program uh, that's coming back to life after the, the pandemic. We have several areas of work that are available from working with the public, uh, uh, doing uh, historic demonstrations, working in the grounds, and we have information on our, on our website. I can, for folks that are interested, 
if you'll uh, just give me a moment. Uh, you can contact us uh, here on the, the screen is, um, is our website where you'll find a link for volunteers, our hours of operation, as well as uh, my, uh, my contact information. And uh, I'd be happy to answer people's questions as well as uh, general information on the, the site, volunteering, uh, rentals and such is all available on our website. Our current hours are listed below Thursday to Saturday, nine to four and Sunday noon to four. And I've been at a number of different events at the uh, village and museum as things loosen up from the pandemic, do you plan to do any uh, special events during the rest of the year? Yeah, um, as things continue to change, uh, the first kind of uh, post opening event that we're looking to do will be in October. Uh, our traditional harvest days um, event, we're looking for Saturday the 9th and Sunday, uh, the 10th of October. And then we're looking to uh, reestablish some of our uh, end of the year events like the Great Bonfire in December. We'll be posting those on our website. I mean, truthfully, as we come back to life, it's a process. So over the rest of the summer, we'll slowly be reopening buildings. Some of our demonstrators will be coming back. Um, it will be in really the spring of 2022 when we kick things off with our annual uh, Charter Day uh, commemoration that we'll be seeing um, uh, a full year of uh, events and programming. But always go to our website and that's where we'll post um, information. Thank you, David. Thank you. Yep, I posted the website um, into the chat so you can just click on that as well. Um, and I want to thank you again. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, thank you, David, for sharing your um, insider's view of their site with us and the history of the site. Um, and Kathy and Michael, thank you both for picking out books people can read and further information and a little bit of history and how the State Library sort of ties into the history of our, of our whole state and what we're preserving for um, the citizens of Pennsylvania. Um, so the next next up in August, we are doing a program with the Drake Well Museum, and we're going to look at the um, the birth of the petroleum industry in Pennsylvania. So um, that will be posted on our website with a link to join. Um, and again, everybody have a great day. Thank you for joining us, and thank you, David. We hope to visit you soon. Come on down. We'd love to have you. <laughs> we will. <laughs>